Hi, Willow, and welcome to Queer Magic. It's great to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Ah, so Willow Moon, fairy, Gardnerian, and Minoan high priest. Um, uh, really delightful to have you here so we can ask you lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a delight to, to be here. And uh, I hope uh, I will have something interesting to say. <laughs> oh, you will, you will. Um, so tell us a bit about you and how long you've been involved in um, paganism and Wicca and witchcraft and the occult. Well, um, I have a long and toward history. I grew up uh, playing in the fields and, and woods and near the Appalachian Mountains. So I always had, as far back as I remember, a really close connection to, uh, to nature. And my grandparents had a farm and we'd you know, be working on the farm. We'd be playing out in the woods. And um, so that's one thing that really attracted me to, to witchcraft was the, uh, the connection to nature, the strength of um, the nature spirituality, that nature wasn't something to be abhorred or used or, or uh, uh, um, ignored, but to be celebrated. And um, so I, I would, uh, you know, hang out in the woods and I just kind of felt, you know, like, wow, this is my temple. And then, uh, and I, it was 1972, I read uh, Paul Hewson's book, Mastering Witchcraft. Ah. Yeah, uh, and that, that just came out, and I saw that in the bookshelf, and I, and I read it, and I thought, wow, this is my path. I have been studying um, all, all many different religions, Christianity, and, and um, Buddhism, and, and Taoism, and Hinduism uh, prior to that, uh, but that really just kind of, uh, uh, that book really sang to me. And, um, and showed me that uh, all my diversity, because I was interested in all this stuff, you know, all these various things, and I didn't really have a umbrella term for it. But then when, when I learned about witchcraft, I thought, oh, well, this is who I am. <laughs> Perfect. Now, I still haven't got around to reading that book. I really, uh, I really need to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, it has, a, it has a very interesting take on, on witchcraft. Um, uh, oh. But uh, uh, yeah, I would recommend it as a fun book to read, if nothing else. Yeah, um, I believe I'm following him on Instagram, actually. So. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. Well, he has, gives a lot of really uh, useful information, I, I thought. You know, you know, just getting started out, know nothing, uh, witchling, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I, I, I did all the stuff that he recommended. And it was like, wow, this stuff works. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Good recommendation. Yeah. And I also think the, the Appalachians seem to be a very magical area because it's also where all the folk music survived and got mm. collected and so on. So yeah, there's definitely something in the water down there. That's what I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> in the water and the air and the land. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, and, and since that time, since uh, the mid '70s, I've been involved in um, either teaching myself or, or uh, at first, and then uh, in the mid '70s, I met uh, Gwydion Peredwin and Allison Harlow. Uh, they're fairy initiates, and I met them and other fairy initiates in the Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, where I lived at uh, for many years, and um, I just really. Um, that was the first witchcraft I actually really was introduced to. And so it seemed like a natural fit to me. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I worked with Compost Coven for about four years. And and um, and uh, then I also worked with Nuru uh, Coven. I became a Nuru Nuru initiate, uh, and, which is a uh, homegrown uh, Bay Area tradition. And yeah. uh, started by one of my dear friends, uh, Judy Greenwood, and um, so, um, uh, so I had my toes dipped into various uh, <laughs> uh, pools of the witchcraft traditions that were uh, um, being uh, done in the Bay Area at that time. Very cool. So yeah, for those who aren't familiar with it, Rugged would be new reformed order of the Golden Dawn, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And it was started uh, by uh, uh, a group of kids that was at uh, San Francisco State University. And um, uh, they had as their school project 
um, to do a witchcraft ritual. And so they cobbled together all the stuff you know, uh, in the early 70s it was a, that it was available publicly that had been written. And um, a, 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 the dash of their own inspiration and imagination. Uh, they did the ritual and the way Judy says it. So we did the ritual and it worked. And so everybody's like, oh, wow, this, this, this is really cool. And then they just decided to continue to get together and do rituals. And then from that, uh, the new tradition was born. And it's, uh, it is uh, about one of the more popular traditions in the Bay Area, or at least it used to be. Yeah, so cool. Yeah. Um, I really like the idea, and they were the ones that did the Eleusinian Mysteries, right? Yes, which is very impressive. We would go up into the uh, west, uh, the, uh, the Marin Hills, and in that area there were um, uh, concrete tunnels that used to be their bunkers from World War left over from World War II. Mm. And um, so we would go down in there carrying torches. We would do a procession from outside and down deep into the, the, the earth. Wow. And, uh, in, and then all the lights would be put out. And then um, we would be in the dark in this a chamber, you know, uh, a complete pitch black wow. uh, uh, for a while. And then a fire would be struck, and then uh, there would be Persephone and, and Hades dancing, you know, in, in the flickering firelight. And it was a very impressive ritual. Wow, <laughs> I love doing that. that. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of magic in the Bay Area at that time, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, there was Victor and Cora Anderson and. Um, I guess, and Starhawk and all that crowd. Oh, yes, yeah. Starhawk, she did public rituals. We did a number of public rituals. Um, um, I wasn't in Starhawk's group, but, but I, I did know her. And it was kind of funny because um, uh, the, during the, the third year uh, anniversary of Three Mile Island disaster, mm. uh, Starhawk uh, uh, put together and led a ritual with a, a number of her folks uh, in the Panhandle in San Francisco. And um, the week before, I'd had a, a, a psychic reading with her, and she was she was telling me about uh, how when she saw me that uh, in one incarnation, I was in Ireland, and uh, my husband uh, died, and uh, then I was put into a convent, oh. uh, you know, to, you know, to keep me under control, or whatever, right? And so, and so, the very next week. Which was that ritual, and um, there was also happened to be the first debut of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. It was our first uh, public uh, uh, um, uh, performance, uh, or you know, as part of the of the rituals yeah. during the procession. And um, so I was one of uh, the sisters, and um, so then the next week, that next time Starhawk saw me. There I was in a Flemish uh, nun's out habit. <laughs> and, uh, and the look of shock on her face is like, <laughs> it's like, okay, then. <laughs> it was just Fantastic. like, funny. So are you but, still involved with the, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence? Uh, no, no. I was just involved at the very beginning uh, uh, when uh, our... Um, um, what they call it, the mother, sister mother. I, I'm, I wasn't a Catholic, so uh, it was a uh, sister missionary position, was our mother superior. Awesome. And so, yeah, and then when she stepped down, uh, then I also, I, I, I decided that what I wanted to do was focus on witchcraft. So <laughs> I went and studied yeah. with Rumpos, um, Calvin, and so on. I was looking at their website the other day, and it's quite, there's quite a big commitment for sure. Like, Seems yeah, like uh, thing, almost. yeah, yeah. Things have changed, and I th I've been. I'm really proud of all, all the work that they've done to help people. You yeah, know, you know, amazing. What yeah. I've heard, you know, it's really become a social organization, and I, I just, I'm very happy for that. Yeah, I think they're amazing. Really cool, for sure. Mm -hmm. but, Indeed. Yeah. Wow, you really have done all the things. <laughs> well, I've been around the block a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So, um, uh, can you tell us a bit about where you fit on the queer landscape, so to speak? 
Well, that was interesting. I love how you uh, your idea about landscape rather than uh, spectrum, because of course uh, we tend to think of the spectrum from male to female. So you know, I would be like a Kinsey six, but however, I would say queer is good for me. Actually, as a good general uh, term, I, I feel I feel comfortable with that in in the sense that queer means different. Yeah. And in fact, that was the first uh, slur that I ever remember being called. As uh, uh, was uh, by my brother who called me queer, uh, and um, for you know because he was mad at me for something you know whatever. And <laughs> I asked my mom, well, "What's that?" Because I, "What's that word? I never heard that before." She said, "My mom said, go look it up in the dictionary." So I did, and it said, "Oh, different, unique." And I said, "Well, I'm different. I'm unique, sure." <laughs> so that's a word that I always felt really comfortable with. And uh, for me, it's broad enough to include everybody uh, who uh, identifies as something different. Yeah. Whether that be sexuality or gender or dress or or style or, you know, just, you know, who they are, you know, so um, that works for me. Uh, but if I was to, um, uh, you know, categorize myself a little bit further, I would say I would be a, a hedge queer. Because I, 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 in my life, throughout my life, I found myself involved in a lot of different groups. Uh, some groups that were very diverse and, and have, have nothing to do with each other. But there I am involved in, 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 in all of them. <laughs> and so I, I tend to live on the boundaries. So um, I feel very comfortable with that. At, at first, it, it would seem like, you know, I don't really fit anywhere. But then now I've come to your, uh, realize over the many years that uh, I kind of fit everywhere. Yeah. Very cool. I like that. Edge queer. Brilliant. <laughs> really good. Um, yeah, I really like that. It's very cool. So, so I've always liked the whole hedge witch thing. Um, uh, so I really like, I like anything with hedge in it. That's really cool. Yeah, me too. Yeah. As you can tell, I like plants. So <laughs> yeah, I'm too. comfortable in the hedge. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. Very good. Um, cool. So tell us a bit about your different traditions and how accommodating or inclusive they are of uh, queer people? Well, yeah, that's a very interesting question because uh, there's a lot of talk about that, uh, particularly the past, more publicly, perhaps the past decade or so. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, well, so I'm an initiative of various traditions, like you mentioned, um, the Anderson Ferry tradition, uh, and, and with that, I've always felt uh, comfortable with my peers and my teachers in that tradition because there's never been a gender check. There's never been any, um, you know, um, problem with sexuality or gender or, or, or just being who you are. In fact, you're expected to be yourself, in mm. fact, right? So th you know, that's a, a mark of, of, uh, of an authentic person. So, um, and Victor, uh, of course, he called he calls himself bisexual. Of course, those were there were terms that people were familiar with at that time, and uh, you know, he said that he was bisexual even in the fifties and forties, wow. and, 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 and well, even at, at, when he was much younger, actually. Um, so he told me a few stories about his life, and which were very endearing, and um, and so really. Um, not only did Victor call himself, you know, bisexual, he also called, he also taught that the, our gods uh, on the spirits that we work with are, um, uh, are, 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 are able to manifest in whatever form, uh, mm -hmm. that they wish whatever is uh, needed, uh, for that person and for that time, for that situation. And so that the goddesses or the gods and the, and the gods, uh, could manifest as either male or female in form and have they have the same sexual potency as a male or female. So a goddess could manifest as a male god and so on and so forth. And of course, we see those uh, statues from ancient Greece of Athena with, with an erection, right? Mm. Uh, so, um, so that was not uncommon in the ancient world. But that's how Victor taught about it. Uh, Victor uh, said, you know, well, like the gods are shapeshifters. They can be whoever they want. They can perform whatever form that they want, and it's appropriate to the person in this situation. Okay. And I always felt really comfortable with that sort of uh, uh, theology, yeah. basic theology. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, when I was a teenager, they had um, on the TV, they had the um, Japanese TV version of Journey to the West, which is the, um, oh yeah, uh, you know, the classic Chinese novel. And, yes, delightful. Um, Quan Yin was played by a man and Tripitaka, the, the main Buddhist monk that travels with the, the three spirits, um, was played by a woman. So I was Wonderful. just, I've always been really, un, really, really comfortable with the idea that, you know, gods can manifest as whatever they want. So I yeah. think that was a big influence for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. I, yeah, that's really nice because that's a, a lovely story. I haven't seen that version of it. We should talk about that sometime. I'd like to see yeah. that. It sounds like fun. It was very cool. Yeah. Uh huh. So it was a Japanese anime. Is that? Like oh, it was, uh, cool. it was like live action. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it was good fun. So with fairy, there's never been an issue about gender or sexuality. It's just not an issue. Yeah. It's like never has been uh, that I know of. Uh, with any initiate or student. Mm. Um, so, um, um, and, and then, uh, so the other tradition that I'm involved in is the Gardnerian tradition, uh, which uh, personally I think is also queer inclusive. Now, a lot of people may might think, what? Because, you know, like there's a lot of stories, you know, about you know, what Gardnerians uh, say and do. Um, uh, but my own personal experience is it's, uh, my uh, gardener and experience has always been uh, queer friendly. Oh, good. Um, it, there's, uh, I've all only covered, covered with queer friendly folks. It's, uh, I can count on, uh, on one hand the times that I've uh, 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 covered with people who discouraged um, um, male, fee, uh, male, uh, male uh, working partners and so on like that. Um, and uh, there was one time at one circle, somebody said, uh, you know, said, you know, tried to separate my, myself and my lover, and we just ignore them. So, well, you know, you have, you have uh, like four women standing on that side of the circle together. What's wrong with two men standing together on this side of the circle? Yeah. So, you know, um, I know, I know that there are people uh, who, you know, uh, 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 try to carry forward Gardner's admonitions against uh, homosexuality. Uh, but I think those admonitions and those and those laws, those rules, those sayings were, were basically um, to help um, uh, keep his uh, the, the craft safe at that time because uh, gay people were illegal. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. same, same thing like what happened, you know, to Turin. You know, he invented the computer, but like you know, you know how he was treated, uh, yeah. as well as so many other folks, Oscar Wilde and so on like this. So. Um, I think he was actually trying to protect um, uh, the witchcraft cult. Um, but, you know, uh, so there are people who carry that forward to this day. But, you know, thankfully, they're an increasing minority. Yes. And, and I see that very clearly in the gardenerian gatherings that I go to uh, and um, uh, so on like that, because people are becoming uh, more educated about our history and about, about the fact that uh, uh, people in, in Rickardwood Coven and various other covens that were close to Gardner, um, that they didn't have a problem working with same-sex couples. And um, so why should we? For instance, Deonis, who was one of uh, Gardner, Gardner's high priestesses, when I asked her if men could cast circles, she said, well, of course, Gardner yeah. did. Um, you know? That's the Long Island thing, that men can't cast circles thing, because I'd never heard of it until, until I came across Long Island people, so. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, different people have different rules, and yeah. it really uh, it really depends upon the coven, the people that you're working with. Because even in lines uh, like the Long Island line, between New York, uh, Long Island line, and Kentucky, uh, Long Island line, there are uh, quite a few differences. And, um, you know, um, uh, I, I think it's a sign of a healthy living tradition yeah, absolutely. when things change yeah. and grow and develop, uh, based upon what has gone before, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, we we honor uh, what uh, what we have learned and, and what uh, and, and those who have taught us and taught those before us. Um, but I think it's important for us to to live the tradition because yeah. the tradition is alive, and it's it, it helps us to 
keep our society alive and in tune with nature. And if you're talking about it uh, being as a nature tradition or a tradition that mimics nature or that uh, encapsulates nature or that um, uh, relates to nature, then we know that there are queer animals in yeah. nature. That's That's been documented many, many times. Uh, and so that's not unusual. Yeah. Uh, and you don't get homophobic animals either. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The other penguins don't go, go, oh, well, we can't hang out with you. <laughs> they don't do that. It's like they just go on with their lives like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. I remember. And, so and it's really old and long. Total tangent, but I remember when I, I worked at a university in, in the UK, um, there was a couple of gay ducks that, that lived by the pond. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, look, lovely gay ducks. And, and the other ducks were fine with it, too. So. Oh, of course they were. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I don't know what goes through their minds, but, you know, uh, you know, it's obviously uh, not homophobia. <laughs> no. well, homosexuality exists in, in uh, hundreds of species of animals, but homophobia in only one. You know? Yes. Uh, yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. Like so, if, but you know, though, no matter how much uh, a, a few, uh, a small minority of the Gardnerians, they like to uh, to um, um, rail against um, same-sex coupling in circle, and um, uh, however that may be, um, uh, that uh, that doesn't change the fact that uh, the charge of God says all acts of love and pleasure our mind rituals, right? Okay. That's so right. Uh, that's right there in, in our liturgy. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty clear. Yep, that's why I use you know? the title of my book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it so, doesn't say all heterosexual acts of love and pleasure, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. It very clearly says all. <laughs> and all actually does mean all. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but but I would I would put a caveat on that as all consensual sex. Definitely, yes. Because you know, be, and, and why is that? Because consensual, non-consensual sex is not about sex; it's about power over. Yeah. Well, also, right? it wouldn't be an act of love and pleasure if it wasn't consensual, would it? Exactly. Exactly so, right. Exactly right. So um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, so the way that I learned the Gardnerian tradition uh, as a Long Island initiate was that uh, the roles of, of priest and priestess are just that, roles. And uh, so the way I was trained is that since uh, 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 it's, it's said in, uh, that a man needs to uh, train a woman and a woman needs to train a man, I need to know the women's parts. I need to not only know how it's said or just reading over it every now and then, but you actually need to know how it works. Mm. So um, it was important for me uh, in my training to learn how to do the women's parts, you know, the women's roles, the high priestess roles. Yeah. And so, so, so we did, every, so everyone in the coven learned all of the parts. Right. So that we could teach whoever that we needed to teach. Yeah. And, and that there was no uh, gender involved in that. So why should it be involved in the performance of those roles right? and yeah. those roles? I mean, this is interesting to me because I, I mean, I've never really, you know, the, the, the Wiccan rituals that I inherited didn't have lots of gendered parts in them. So, um, mm, yes, I think, I think we, there's extra, extra material there or something but um yeah i just always found that like where well, you could have most of this stuff could be done by either um, by any gender kind of thing so exactly yes and, and uh, there are as you know uh well uh, there are and i i can't really talk about it uh, because you know it's uh, it's circle okay. strip but, <laughs> but there are all kinds of examples within the circle strip script where a gender is bent yeah. Okay. So we know that as initiates, uh, and, um, and 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 not only that, but when you think about it, if we were to drop these um, 
trying to fit people into boxes. So, uh, and, and trying to fit people into roles rather, rather than uh, expressing the roles with power, grace, and beauty, uh, then we would be able to drop the intellectual barriers to power. Yeah. Right? Because, because I, I've talked to some priestesses, priestesses and they have said, well, in our circles, I feel the power going from uh, directly from a male to a female and female to a male, you know, even though it's across the room and so on like this. And um, my example is, is an, an example of, uh, of pheromones. So that, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, uh, pheromones are hormones uh, that are exuded or that, uh, uh, from the body, that are excreted from the body and uh, so into the air. And uh, they act like hormones in the sense that um, they perve permeate the whole uh, space in the same way that hormones permeate our whole body. Mm. But hormones, like pheromones, only work on specific uh, areas uh, in our body or on specific people uh, mm. in the environment. And that's because they have the receptors. So, so the hormones will only work on certain areas in our body because the that's where the receptor is. Right. And the same way with people, with the pheromones. Uh, uh, certain people will react in a certain ways to different pheromones because they have this receptors. So to me, it's really natural for gay men and as well as women to react to uh, a male in a similar way. Yeah. And, and, and so to me, I, I like to think of, you know, uh, uh, that as a, a part of biology. I, I like to think of magic in terms of biology uh, because magic is natural. Magic is of our body. It's the power that uh, exudes from our body and from the earth herself. So, of course, it would be uh, in tune with biology. Yeah. But, but real biology, not fake biology. So exactly. some people like to use this kind of fake, you know, fit 1950s type of biology uh, to uh, explain and boost their prejudices. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like I said earlier, and like we were talking about earlier, there's all kinds of homosexual examples, uh, examples of homosexual behavior in animals. And so uh, we know that. And, uh, and, and yet people will say it's unnatural because of the biology. That to me is fake biology. If you want real biology, you know, you know, pay attention <laughs> to what's really going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love your thing about the pheromones because that cuts through all the bullshit about oh, polarity, male and female. It's like no, like if if you're if you pick up on those pheromones, then you know that's happened. Yes. I love that. Yes. Well, yeah. I think of polarity. I think. The, as a law of magic, which to me is just simply a law of magic is simply a description of how magic works. Yeah. So for me, polarity is simply a description, one description of how magic works in the body. And, 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 and like you've pointed out many times, and it's based upon the ancient concept of yin and yang, you know, uh, uh, which actually was a geological concept. Uh, oh. So this, so yin, it, if you look at the Chinese character, it describes a picture of a shady side of the hill, and the character for yang describes a picture of a sunny side of the hill. Right. So originally they were the sunny, shady, and the sunny side of the hill, and then you could, uh, uh, it, it, you know, you could add on to that in multiple ways. So inner, inside, outside. Uh, you know, upper, lower, all these things. So, so that's one of the yin yang theories. The theory of yin yang in Chinese medicine is that anything and everything can be reducible uh, to yin and yang. Even if, so, if you take the table, so is, is it the upper side of the table or the underside of the table? Is it the right side of the table or the left side of the table? You know, and so on, like that, and so on, so on, and so forth. So things can be broken down ad infinitum into yin and yang. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we connect yeah. with this, like, you know, I can have yin things and yang things in my personality, and I can be yeah. more yang in relation to that person, but more yin in relation to that person over there. Exactly, because yin and yang is a relationship. That's all it is. It's not, there's not a yin thing or a yang thing. Something is yin in relationship to one thing, but yang in relationship to another, like you described. 
Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, so I think of polarity in that way. So anything can be made into polarity, like you described. Yeah. And so that makes sense to me. Uh, but I think for humans in the body, our polarity, uh, the power of polarity, the magic of polarity manifests to me as sexual attraction, as this juiciness within ritual. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, like, I, I want to have sex with you type of sexual attraction. It could be just like a twinkle in the eye. Yeah. It could be just be like, oh, I have a good feeling, good vibe with you sort of thing, a, a sense of comfort. Yeah. A sense of trust, right? I had a or, friend who, who felt that um, whenever whenever you're friends with someone, it's because there's a sublimated connection, you know, a sublimated sexual connection between you, and you might never act on that on that feeling, but it's there as a sort of sub subtext of the whole experience. Yeah, and I think we have a lot of that in all kinds of variations. And yeah. with people and uh, uh so part of that uh is is rapport and, and which is essential in any uh magic working in circle i think um and uh <clears throat> but you can't really build rapport if you have to pretend to be something that you're not yeah because it's so funny. yeah exactly so you know that's why i'm at the point in the past i've uh, been in some gardenerian circles where people uh, have asked me not to uh have a male working partner. And uh, I've complied with that to, you know, to circle with folks because I want to get together with folks and and, and, and and have a good time and and not make a big stink of things. Uh, but at, at this point in my life, I, I really can't do that anymore. I feel like I need to uh, just be authentic in front of the gods. And I recently heard that somebody who was saying that, who was a gay man, that uh, in circles that they are straight. Oh, ah. and out of circle they're not exactly it's like how could you you're in front you're you before the gods like right. this is magic ritual isn't that when you want to be most authentic because i'm sure the gods can tell yeah. <laughs> and they're probably thinking uh-huh uh-huh right. <laughs> I always, I always say, you know, we're bringing our whole self before the gods why would we why would i check my bisexuality at the door why would i check my gender at the door I'm yes. non-binary, I'm bisexual, the gods know that, and I'm going to be my full self before the gods. That's right. And we are sexual beings in our bodies. It's just, it's, just, it's all natural. It, yeah. it, it really, and, and there's no reason why we have to pretend to be something that we're not, or to shut down our sexuality in circle. There's no reason for that. And in fact, I think it's detrimental. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's one of the benefits uh, of um, getting uh, people going beyond this idea where things have to be uh, gendered in a certain way. Uh, because if you allow people to be people, if you allow queer people to be people or any other marginalized group to be themselves, that allows everyone to be themselves. Mm. You know, so that, that uh, frees up the energy for uh, heterosexual oriented folks as well. Yeah, that, it creates that, space of expansiveness, right? Yes, exactly. They don't have to worry about, you know, you know, playing a role that they may not quite fit into. They also have, have that freedom. And, and, and that that sense of freedom is really the basis of a perfect love and perfect trust. Yeah. Is it not? Yep. Definitely. Yep. It, 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 you're free to be yourself. You're free to be your authentic self. And if you can't do that in circle then where is the trust? Yeah. And where's the love? Because it's not loving to force somebody to be something other than they're not. Yes. Other than true. they are. I mean, yeah. 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 Exactly. So, so I do know that there are the naysayers in the guardian craft, but as I say, uh, they're an increasing minority. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And then uh, as far as my other tradition, uh, the Minoan tradition, um, that is is a specifically a queer tradition the Minoan Brotherhood. Uh, it's a style of witchcraft that was created by Eddie Bozinski uh, in the 70s um, uh, uh, based upon the way he was treated by uh, Gardnerians in New York City uh, during the, the 70s, right? So him and Lady Mew created a tradition um, uh, that was based upon uh, 
what was known of the Minoan culture at that time. And, uh, and of course, in the Minoan Brotherhood, covens and initiations are exclusively uh, men. And all of our rituals are homocentric based mythos. Um, uh, it's, it's the mythos of the great mother and uh, her children, um, which are seen as uh, the divine male twins. Right. Yeah. And so it's quite interesting because there's a little bit of overlap between the Minoan tradition in that regard and the fairy tradition. Because in the fairy tradition, we have great respect and there are many uh, fairy initiates who, who honor the twins as uh, the children of the, uh, of the great mother of the star goddess. Yeah. And so those twins, they can be either male, female, male, male, female, female, or any combination thereof. Cool. Yeah. And and so I I, I sometimes think that of the Minoan tradition as being like a, a special cult of uh, the divine twins. Right. Interesting. I didn't know that. It's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. really quite a lovely tradition. It's very beautiful. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, well, music, pageantry, pomp, and circumstance. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Yeah, and there's a, like a Minoan sisterhood as well, isn't there? Or something? Yes, yes. That's a, a, a part that Lady Mew started. And I don't know much about them, so it's, I don't really know how much to speak about them, uh, uh, except that they were a tradition that was started at the same time. Uh, right. That was uh, at that time it was exclusively women, uh, as like the brotherhood was, was exclusively men, and then um, the idea is that every now and then uh, the, these two groups would then get together and have a grand circle. Oh, nice! I like <laughs> it. Very cool. Um, so, what about uh, sort of practicing on your own? Do you do stuff on your own? And <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, to me. My magic is my life. Um, uh, I've, uh, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, literally, I'm doing some sort of a ritual and, um, and or meditation and or energy working. And since I've been involved in a lot of different traditions, uh, not only uh, my witchcraft traditions, but also uh, um, uh, Buddhist uh, Tantra, uh, uh, traditions, uh, the Vajrayana, and uh, so that gives me lots of stuff to do, yeah. and uh, and and I incorporate it into my life uh, because I'm I'm a householder. Uh, I'm not a, a, a yogi in the in the forest, so um, uh, I do rituals. I do maybe uh, typically half a dozen rituals, lasting about you know anywhere from ten to twenty minutes uh, throughout the day, and then I'll be doing I'll be sprinkling various activities. Um, well, that'll be a formal, you know, more, more, more formal meditation, but then I'll be doing uh, practices, rituals, but then I'll be doing, um, things throughout the day. Like when I, you know, dig in the ground and, uh, you know, planting plants, you know, I, I say prayers and I talk to the earth and, and, and to the plants. And so, um, uh, for me, magic is to be lived. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so how about books? Would you do well, you have a favorite one? Well, well I actually have yeah, I do. All right. <laughs> I do. In my very first book I read on witchcraft uh, and the great gay counterculture by uh, uh, Arthur Evans. Oh yes. I love that book. That one uh, that was the very first I, I remember reading that in San Francisco in the 70s, and it's like wow kind of blew my socks off uh you know conceptually at that time and then a, a couple other books i would recommend is blossom the bone by o'connor oh, uh, yeah. and then also uh, queer spirits by will roscoe those are my favorites um and uh the reason i like them uh is because uh, uh they've given me uh, like history a queer history which you know of course i had no idea uh, uh prior to that and um uh, so they kind of filled in, you know, like um, the gaps of like, oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just not stuff that, you know, we're making up now, but it's stuff that's, you know, a part of uh, a people's uh, traditions for a, a long time, you know, and, and, and not that that matters so much. I mean, it doesn't devalue what we're doing now, but it's just nice to know that there's 
a continuity there, that there are, 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 are roots, you know, in the landscape, so to speak, yeah. uh, 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 of, the, of the psyche, of the queer psyche. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really important because, you know, there's, there's been such an effort to kind of erase queerness from history and yes um, and actually bringing it back and saying look you know this is part of spirituality this is this is part of paganism and it is um and you know we had specific roles and we were honored and you know it also gives the lie to this kind of you know there's all these people who think that trans people have only just been invented or something uh, <laughs> there were trans people in or you know there were people who were like trans people in antiquity so of course of course, there were the Megabazui, who were yeah. uh, priests of uh, Diana, particularly. Right. The they, they, yeah, they were like railed against well, how effeminate they were. They wore purple. Oh my God! And then they, uh, they, uh, they did their hair up like women and and wore women's ornaments and you know and, and tinkly bells and all this sort of stuff. Wow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cross gendered priests, I I think, uh, were quite common in the pagan world uh, yeah. from my reading of historical sources. Uh, and I and actually I think that's one of the reasons why, and I and I could be very wrong about this, and maybe it's prejudiced of me to say so, but this is one of the reasons why I think uh, Christians are so much against um, gay people is because of there was this memory of the power of gay priests and yeah. and, and sorcerers and and they really and they equate this the you know the. Uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, gay priests with paganism. So there's, I think there's this equation there and also as well as women's uh, rights and women held in high status. In, mm. and not in every pagan culture, as we know, but in uh, many pagan cultures in the uh, Middle East, uh, I, I mean, in the, around the Mediterranean, uh, women and queer folks were held in, in higher status. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that, that Christians may subconsciously associate you know high status for women and gay people with paganism and therefore anti-christian I, I could be wrong but yeah it seems i don't to me. know i mean i know somebody who's done a load of research on on queer saints and queer christians so in the early period of christianity so yeah uh, yeah like um the, the student cosmos cosmos and um Yes. Oh, and yeah. yeah, and also Felicity and Perpetua, and yeah, yeah. Damien and yeah. Cosmos. That's it. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah, I don't know. I think. I mean, obviously, the mainstream of Christianity would have suppressed that, and maybe that's why. But well, I think the early church, the early Christianity, was much more egalitarian. Yeah. I mean, women ha had power in the early uh, Christian sects, and so on. Like that is is only until I think the four hundreds or so that things started to change then yeah when it from, all, my, from my understanding yeah. yeah i got tangled up with the roman empire i think that's what did it yeah right Urgh, supremacy and all that sort of stuff yes yeah, yeah. well you know and, and so reading books like the ones i recommended uh, the ones i've read and i enjoyed uh, you know um, not only did it give me a sense of a uh, greater sense of history but also strengthened my pride you yeah. know and in, in, in our community and and uh, in, in, in who we are uh, where we came from and what we are capable of yeah, and yeah. I think that's so important because, you know, people with no, it's like if you haven't got a history and, and something to look back on, then, you know, it's like you need that for your roots. It's yeah, sure. Important. And for context. Yeah, because yeah. I think that gave me a context for further explorations into queer magic. Yeah. You know, I, really, I really feel like, you know, wow, there is a context for this. There is a place for me. There's a place for this. And, you know, um, that's important definitely yeah yeah i think so so um that leads us neatly on to do you have a <laughs> definition of queer magic <laughs> well uh, when you first thought of, when you when i first I, I heard about that question i think uh i don't know <laughs> of course and then but what <laughs> so i had to think about it and um for me, of course, uh, uh, how I would see queer magic look like, what that, how that would look different than uh, other magic would be that there would be no gender checks ever. Yeah. 
there would not even be the, the consideration of doing gender checks. Like, and that's really how most of my fairy circles and Minoan circles, well, uh, well Minoan circles may be a little bit different because it's separated into male and female. So, so the fairy circles and in my experience with gardener and circles, there never have been any gardener gender checks. Mm. So I would say, well, that would be queer magic in that sense. Yeah. And, and then, of course, if you look at uh, Marcel Ma uh, Maus's uh, book uh, uh, that he wrote in the 1950s, um, The General Theory of Magic, um, he explains uh, that um, the definition of magic is what is, uh, ex what is at the limits of accepted society. So magic is always done like in secret, in private. Uh, it's unorthodox uh, in that time that he was writing. And, mm -hmm. um, and that it's always like on the limits, uh, the boundaries of society. And in that sense, then all magic is queer magic, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, so because I magic is, you know, on the limits of society, it's forbidden as are queers. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so it's so, so, so in that way, you know, uh, you, you could look at, take a very broad view of queer magic. However, uh, as, as, a, as that is the basis of understanding, um, I, I, I do think that there is very uh, unique and unnecessary power in the myths and rituals that retell and empower specifically queer deities and activities. Mm. I think there is a real, uh, be not only beauty, but a real, real strength in that. And, um, uh, and, and I think that this power, you know, I, I think it's true of any magic circle, really, but uh, particularly in rituals where you are uh, uh, retelling the myths or empowering the activities of the, of the, the deities, the queer deities, uh, the queer spirits. Uh, that 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 power ripples out into our society mm -hmm. and has an effect on the group mind of our society yeah. and yeah. and yeah and so and then that in, in my sense then that helps to um, uh, strengthen and make the way easier for uh, uh, those who of us who are more uh, socially active who can uh, who, who protest and and you know who do uh, uh, stand up for their rights and uh, fight for our rights in in, in public and in, you know in the legislature and, and um, uh, it, it makes it 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 it, it um, energizes that force it energizes that 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 force of of cultural moving of people moving forward. Yeah. in their ideas and, and in fact that's one of the ideas of the Manon Brotherhood is that we do rituals that are queer based that are focused on retelling queer myths and reenacting queer activities so that that ripples out into our, our culture at large making um, it an easier um, time for us to be accepted. Yeah makes sense I mean as we've sort of approach this question of what is queer magic um, from all different angles, um, we've pretty much ended up with the definition that that all magic is queer because <laughs> um, partly because of what you said, but also like magic is sparkly and fabulous and transformative yes. and being <laughs> queer is sparkly and fabulous and transformative. And right? fun. <laughs> yeah, and fun. Um, so yeah, like everyone's come up, come at it from a slightly different angle, but we've kind of ended up with this big picture that, yeah, like magic just is queer and queer just is magic, um, which is quite fun, so. Yeah, yeah, but I do think that there is a power in working with specific queer oh, deities definitely. and yes. mythologies, yes. Yes, I mean, it's, I wouldn't want to dilute that by, by sort of, I mean, obviously if you've got people working in a, a very uptight sort of straight kind of way then then clearly that's, that's not queer magic <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly why because they're not having any fun <laughs> right there you go yeah no just take they, they just need to take the sticks out of their butts so yeah uh, yeah there you go yes and replace them with something else <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> 
Oh, okay then. <laughs> well, there you go. Solve that problem. Um, so yeah, tell us about your uh, the blog that you contribute to as well. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, um, so all of my uh, public articles uh, uh, can be found on anderson-ferry.org. Uh, uh, that's A N D E R S O N dash F A E R Y dot org. So there's many different ways to spell fairy, of course. And um, uh, so I have uh, all uh, my articles that are uh, publicly available are there and uh, for free. You can just, you know, go to the website and, and read it. And um, uh, but uh, uh, there are a couple of particular articles that I've written that may uh, draw you uh, your attention to uh, that may be of particular interest. And uh, one is uh, mountain and lake. Primordial, uh, primal polarities. And uh, this is where I explore the ancient ideas of geological polarity based on the original concept of yin and yang as the shaded and sunny side of a hill. So I go into a lot of different, you know, around the world sort of geological examples of polarity. I love that. So right. that, so it, so it, so it kind of takes that idea of polarity away from just the bits hanging between your legs part. Yeah, which I don't think that is a polarity at all, personally. I mean, you know, I, I think... <laughs> Depending on I think what you I got. Actually, yeah, I know, but I, I think I actually work with the polarity of, like, introvert and extrovert. Ah, you're right, yeah. And the polarity of, you know, the supposed polarity of male and female or whatever, you know. But I do like yeah. your let's bring it down to pheromones thing, because I think... Um, that, takes, well, that's the, that that also takes the gender out of it. So, sure, and it gets down to just basic biology. Yes, yeah. say, and you get down to basic geology, basic geology, basic biology. You know what's there in the world? What can we see uh, and, and look at and experience? And how is that? Is that gendered? No. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, we have words you know, that express genders for objects, you know, in particular languages and so on like that. As we know, English doesn't have that. But but um, so we can impose gender ideas on anything, on any object. But yeah. isn't that just a label? Yeah. Yeah. So and, and it can be a useful label. I'm not saying all labels are not useful and, and, and ways to talk about things can be very useful, uh, but they can also get in the way. Of our yeah. experiencing the realness of the natural world yeah the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon yes indeed, <laughs> indeed. i like that saying <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. yes that's right but at least we become confused <laughs> so and so the, so that's the uh, mountains and, and lake primal polarities and then another uh, article i wrote is called law of polarity and in that one, I discuss the polarity is one of the ways that magic works biologically and has no relationship to gender, like I mentioned earlier. But I go into more detail with that. Uh, and that from the perspective of the body, polarity as a force of magic works regardless of one's gender or sexuality. Yeah. 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 And so then, uh, then another uh, article that I wrote that might be of interest uh, is is, um, is uh, an article called um, um, "Queer Magic," and and in that article I demonstrate uh, that history supports the inclusion of queer folks in Gardnerian style craft uh, and in all BTW style craft, uh, and and that can be useful to understand. Um, where the craft is coming from in a context. And then it also, uh, I explore the close connection between queers and fertility rights, particularly oh, in Britain. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so there is a very close connection uh, uh, with transvestites in particular, uh, the Betty the, uh, and so on like this, that's found in uh, British folk customs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and the reason I think that uh, transvestites and queer folks, uh, people who express both genders, where one single person expresses both genders, is important in fertility rights, is because the, um, that kind of a figure uh, uh, harkens back to the mythology of, uh, of Ymir, of the first giant who was progenitor of, of nature. 
And yeah. I know this is a northern myth, but these these myths, you know, spread throughout Europe, and they had their own correspondences in their own places. Um, uh, but I think I think that the expression of two different genders or a, a variety of genders in one person uh, expresses uh, the union of male and female male before creation. Yeah. So you have that in many different types of traditions, as you're probably aware of, too, in Hindu and so on like this, yeah. where you have this, this concept where uh, godhood came out of uh, um, a non-gendered space, right? So, so, so before creation, there was no gender, just to God or to mm -hmm. the goddess or to, you know, the spirit right. of, of yeah. creation. Yeah. And then uh, after creation, then you have the male and female coming together. Uh, to promote fertility. So actually, I think that's why it's important uh, to have that symbol of, uh, of one person uh, combining uh, all the gender possibilities mm. as an example of uh, the power of creation, right. which is, of course, is the source of fertility. Yeah, I love that. That's really cool. Uh -huh. I was thinking it made me think of the, um, I think it's Herodotus that talks about um the the in the golden age there was um the people were both male and female they weren't gen they weren't separate genders but they were you know they were all genders in one go yes. um, so maybe that's right that as well. yes yeah. that's so that's what I, I i that's what i think you know that's my own you know gnosis I about that. that so i really <laughs> like that pretty cool yeah <laughs> yeah and so uh, that's one of the things that I explore in that article uh, uh, more in depth. And uh, then I also explore what queer ritual could look like and the benefits that such magics in our society as a whole. Uh, so uh, so those, those three articles in particular uh, folks might find interesting. Yeah, definitely. Really cool. Very, very yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, pretty cool. So that brings us to the last question, which is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, um, well uh, so what would I see queer ritual, what would queer ritual look like to me? Uh, would be something that would be joyous, that would be fun, that would be beautiful, that would be authentic. Um, um, and uh, that would have a, 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 a palpable feeling of um, a, 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 a meaning and and uh, energy, you know, of life force. Um, so the, the queer rituals that I've been involved in, uh, it, uh, some with uh, the um, um, uh, when I was involved with the. Um, radical fairies and, and uh, you know they have a, 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 you know a silliness to them a sense of joy a sense of just exuberance in life uh, yeah. a, as it is and I think that's something that uh, that queers can bring to the tables specifically that we're, yeah. you know, we're, we're very good at you know finding you know within the doldrums of life and the suppression of the of, of, of the absurd uh we have found a, a vitality, you know, in our own beings, in our own bodies, in our own sexuality, uh, which I think is a gift to society. Yes, I think that's that's very true. And like, I really value the, you know, both the. I always, I actually feel you can't have mirth without reverence, without mirth, um, <laughs> and and that together they they create the the idea of being merry. Um, which was originally something quite, quite, you know, it's sort of strong and, and assertive kind of, you know, it meant forceful or well, not forceful. Vi vivacious, yeah. vivid. Vivacious, yes. That's yeah. 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 Um, and so, yeah, I really like that. It's really cool. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, another really good benefit is like I had mentioned before that, it, you know, being ourselves 
is an example for others to be themselves. Yeah, it really frees up. Yeah. It frees up that space that, you know, um, if the most marginalized person can be themselves, then everybody can be themselves. Yes, exactly. And then I think we can get back to a more natural society uh, where homosexuals and heterosexuals are seen for their complementary uh, 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 benefits to society. You know, so I think, yes, the heterosexual couples uh, have the benefit of, of producing more people for society to be a part of into the so society can continue on into the future. But homosexual relationships are, are about uh, uh, trades, uh, trade uh, uh, relationships and about uh, 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 groups of people uh, holding the, uh, the circle together. You know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's what connects society uh, uh, around the perimeter, around the borders. And, and I think, you know, the, uh, the heterosexual relationships are, are, are good at, at the hearth in the home and producing um, um, uh, a society uh, but then it's the, uh, the homosexual, the queer uh, folks, the relationships that are, are outside of that, which gives give a context and a meaning and a power and a protection to society that wouldn't otherwise be there. Yeah. So okay. I think, you know, we, we have, we, we, we should work together because I think then our society will be wholer and healthier. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I was thinking about... Um, the, ki the kitty wake, uh, which is a, a bird where um, they have uh, two females who are basically lesbian kitty wakes, um, and they they sit on the nest, um, and they take it in turns to sit on the on the egg. So one of them is, um, and one of them is you know fertilized by the male kitty wake, um, and then he comes along as well. So it's like a little menage a trois. And then the um, the so but the lesbian kitty wakes take it in turns to sit on the nest uh, with the male. Yeah, yeah, they make it work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I just I love the idea of lesbian kitty wakes. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew about that. Thank yeah, you for letting me know. Cool. That's delightful. Yeah, <laughs> that is delightful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you know that that's kind of like an integrated. Um, you know, they're they're creating that little microcosm of what you were talking about so yeah yeah exactly that we all have a part to play in our society and when we ostracize and denigrate and disgrace and and remove people from our society we become for the whole society as a whole becomes poorer for that yeah absolutely i mean just look at florida yeah yeah and, and just think what would have happened if, if turin you know uh had been uh you know uh uh, put in jail before he invented the computer, for instance. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So, well, you know. I was thinking, well, wouldn't it have been amazing if he hadn't been persecuted and hounded and then. It, exactly. What may, what more may, what could he have created for, yeah. that would have bettered our society? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely one of my heroes cheering. <laughs> Good guy. Yeah, because we wouldn't be doing this otherwise, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, also my day job is a software developer, so yep, definitely one of my guys, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's uh, you know, I um, thank you for sharing your wonderful ideas and wisdom with us. Um, always appreciated, and. Um, you know, I just, I love your, I love the way you think. I think it's really great. And you've got some really original ideas, which I love. So, you know, thanks. Thanks for this. It's been really, really great. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you too. And I hope uh, uh, other folks can, you know, get something out of it. And my I own, thought uh, it will. Yeah. Thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. All right. Well, uh, I will stop recording and then um, we can chat. So. All right, sweetie. Bye-bye.